On BBC Two in a moment, The Commanding Sea with Claire Francis. And this week she looks at man's assault on the oceans for food and energy, in particular oil exploration. Here on One in a Moment, the Sunday film is the story of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Torah, Torah, Torah. Then at 9.35, that's life. Esther Ranson and her team will have some more bizarre goings on, including Les Dawson adding his weight to the Great British Laughter Contest. After the news, at 10.30, every man presents Daddy King, a portrait of Martin Luther King Sr., father of the famous civil rights leader. Europe Inside Out at 5 past 11 looks at how China views its future relationship with Europe. And then at 11.30, there's the second part of the Corrie's 21st anniversary concert. Programmes tonight, here on BBC One. So now we come to the Sunday film. Torah, Torah, Torah. In next week's film, John Wayne is the magnificent showman, a circus owner who brings his whole show to Europe and into a series of romantic misadventures. Claudio Cardinale co-stars with John Wayne in The Magnificent Showman at 7.15 next Sunday. The film for tomorrow is the classic spaghetti western for a few dollars more, starring Lee Van Cleef and Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. When two hunters go after the same prey, they usually end up shooting each other in the back, and we don't want to shoot each other in the back. I want to get my hands on Indio, too. Sure. After me. Clint Eastwood. A few dollars more tomorrow at 9.25. On BBC Two in about four minutes, Hockney at Work, a film which goes behind the colourful public image of artist David Hockney. Here on BBC One, that's life. Hello, well I hope you'll be joining us for another week on Nationwide. This week we shall be travelling to Austria with the young recruits for the new West End production of The Sound of Music. Wonderful. Nicholas Woolley joins seven of the children chosen to play alongside Petula Clark as they follow in the footsteps of the original Von Trapp family in the Austrian mountains. And we celebrate 25 years of the Liberace fan club as they join their glittering hero on a visit to London. Then tomorrow, Watchdog investigates whether new space-saving spare wheels are really safe. And former world title holder Terry Griffiths shows us all how to play snooker like a champion. And we'll also be asking you what you'd like to ask Mrs. Thatcher. So, I hope you'll join us for another week nationwide. And after tomorrow's edition of Nationwide, the rest of the evening looks like this. There's another round of Ask the Family with Robert Robinson at 6.55, followed at 7.20 by Star Trek and a desperate situation for the crew of the Starship Enterprise. At 10 past 8, following the first round of the French presidential elections, Panorama reports on the state of France after seven years of Giscard d'Estaing. The Monday film at 9.25 is the classic spaghetti western for a few dollars more, starring Clint Eastwood and Lee Van Cleef as two bounty hunters who join forces to track down a psychopathic killer. Education Shop at 11.30 gives advice to parents who feel that their children could do better. Programmes tomorrow evening here on BBC One. Back to this evening, and in ten minutes, every man presents a portrait of Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., father of the famous civil rights leader. Now on BBC One at 10.20, the news with Kenneth Kendall. Valérie Giscard d'Estaing leads in the first round of the French presidential election. 
Conservative MP Barry Porter has sent a letter bomb. He thinks it's connected with the IRA hunger strike. As the April blizzard sweeps south, hundreds of thousands face a night without electricity. And Prince Charles takes another tumble from a horse. French voters have been to the polls to decide who should be their next president. And tonight, it looks as though Valérie Giscard d'Estaing stands a very good chance of staying in office for another seven years. His rival in the second round of voting in a fortnight's time will be the veteran socialist leader François Mitterrand. A few percentage points separated them. But they were well clear of the gaullist Jacques Chirac and the communist Georges Marché. His party's share of the vote was lower than it's been since the war. This report from Michael Burke in Paris. Until the moment, a short while ago, when the ballot boxes were emptied, there'd been no way of judging the political temper of the French electorate. Polls are banned here in the election's final stages, and all the candidates have been claiming big gains. In the event, this first poll, if not a vote of confidence for President Giscard d'Estaing, showed no strong desire for a change. If it's duplicated in the next round, it won't produce one. There'd been ten candidates in the race, but only four really counted. The communist vote for George Marche collapsed. It was their worst result since the war. Their vote slid over to the veteran Francois Mitterrand of the Socialists, their best result since the war, taking their leader into the final round. The energetic right-winger, Jack Chirac, did fairly well, but nothing like enough to keep him in the race. President Giscard d'Estaing won 4% less of the vote than he did at this point in the last election. Still, there was every sign of satisfaction at the president's campaign headquarters tonight. His supporters knew by then that there'd been no perceptible swing to the left in the country that might deprive him of a second term. This presidential election then will be a repeat of the last. Giscard d'Estaing in a runoff against the socialist Francois Mitterrand. At this stage, it seems likely the final result will be the same too. The socialists have increased their vote only at the expense of the communists. And Monsieur Mitterrand appears unable to capture the centre ground of French politics. He may not even get the communist vote in the second round. They'll be more anxious than ever to avoid being submerged, even if by withholding their support, they make the president's re-election that much more certain. Michael Burke, BBC, Paris. Here at home, MPs and other public figures are being warned tonight to be on their guard for letter bombs. One arrived yesterday at the Birkenhead home of Conservative MP Barry Porter, who's putting the blame on supporters of IRA hunger striker Bobby Sands. First, Mr. Porter's wife, Susan, who's six months pregnant, became suspicious of the package. Then, he carefully opened it and noticed wires inside. He picked it up, put it next to him in his car, and drove straight to the police, who issued tonight's warning. Alistair MacDonald asked him, how did you react when you realised what it was? Well, I'm, I'm not as sensible as my wife. She pointed out that it was a suspicious package, but I couldn't really think that I was important enough for anybody to send me anything like that. So I looked at it and merely slit it with my thumbnail. And when I saw the wires inside, I decided that was time to stop opening it. In retrospect, don't you think it was rather dangerous to take it to the police station? I think it was rather stupid, actually. I should have put it in a bucket of water. But uh, as I say, my first thought was to get it away from my wife and family. Why do you think you have been chosen as a target? Well, if I, I, I think it's probably been a warning. Um, from those who are interested in Northern Irish affairs, and I think it's probably because I attended a meeting some fortnight ago in the House of Commons when there were some people there interested in the hunger striker. Um, Bobby Sands' agent was there and his sister was there. And they, I asked one or two questions which apparently weren't altogether popular. Are you surprised that you're a target? Yes. Uh, again, I didn't think I was important enough. And what's your reaction now? Are you worried? No. If they think that by sending me threats of this sort, they're going to stop me saying what I think, they, they can think again, because I won't. Mr. Sands, who began his protest when he refused breakfast on March the 1st, is now, according to his family tonight, extremely weak. And they say that at one point last night, he nearly died. The Northern Ireland office would say only that his condition continues to deteriorate. Mr. Sands, he's the second from the left in this picture, is now in the ninth week of his fast. And support came for him today in marches in London and Belfast. There were some arrests in London. And before the Belfast march began, police fired plastic bullets as H Block supporters began stoning them. The demonstration, though, was trouble free. Mike Mackay reporting. 
It's been some time since Republican sympathizers marched through Belfast with quite this degree of support and this degree of emotional intensity. And it took place in a mood of bitterness and confusion generated by the breakdown of the mediation effort by the Human Rights Commissioners. A red herring, an elaborate diversion, was how the Hunger Strike Committee saw it. The Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Hawkey, came in for as much hostility from the marchers as Mrs. Thatcher. At the rally, the Irish leader was accused of implying the European commissioners had a quick answer to the dispute. And the biggest applause of the day was when the crowd heard Bobby Sands was now ready once more to die for his cause. An assurance made before Marcella, his sister, who'd made the abortive appeal to the Human Rights Commission. And many of Mr. Sands' supporters have tonight called on Mr. Hockey to intervene with Mrs. Thatcher and bring the hunger strike to an end. But according to our Northern Ireland political correspondent, the indications are that Mr. Hockey, who supports the human rights visit, won't make any further dramatic move. Cardinal Hume, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, was in Northern Ireland today, and in Londonderry, the message of his sermon was, Love your neighbour. He followed that with a warning. We are, he said, in great danger of a breakdown in our society. Brian Hanrahan reporting. The Cardinal's visit to Londonderry was long planned, and it was coincidence that brought him to the city after a week of rioting in which three people died and to the church from which one of them had been buried. He'd come to ordain a new priest, and during the ceremony he praised the people of the Cregan for their cheerfulness and courage despite the suffering. In an earlier sermon, he told the people that Christian communities should love their neighbours. It might seem a naive command, but it should control their actions. Cardinal Hume also had a neighbourly encounter with Mr Ian Paisley on the plane out. They'd sat next to each other. Had they talked? No, we didn't. Did, did you have any conversation? Well, like uh, characteristic of travellers on uh, aeroplanes. Um, you, you recognised each other? Uh, well, I certainly recognised him. I don't know whether he recognised me. It's been the turn of the south and southwest of England to face the worst spring blizzards of this century. Hundreds of thousands of homes have lost their electricity supplies. Army helicopters are flying along power lines to find the faults. There are water shortages in Northamptonshire and Bedfordshire. Five teenage boys are still missing on Dartmoor, and army helicopters rescued old people and babies trapped on Salisbury Plain. John Norman reports from Bristol. Practically every main road in Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and Somerset was blocked this morning, with towns and villages cut off. On Salisbury Plain, police used helicopters to reach drivers who'd been stranded. Many cars became stuck in the Cotswolds, where high winds caused widespread drifting. Some of their occupants managed to walk to shelter, others spent the night in their cars and were cared for by firemen who found them during special patrols this morning. Two coachloads of old people were stranded by deep snow near Sirencester. They were taken to nearby houses for the night and no one was the worse for their experience. Troops who were on exercise in the Cotswolds shouldered their guns and put shovels to good use on the hilly roads. Their efforts did much to keep the traffic moving. Large areas of the West Country are still without electricity. Gale force winds and ice during the night brought down power lines and it will be tomorrow before all supplies can be restored. Even the repair teams have been getting stuck in the snow. The loss of power also brought pumping equipment to a standstill and many homes are without water. By late this afternoon, most of the main roads had been cleared, but side roads and country lanes are still blocked, and the police have appealed for motorists to stay at home. Nine British Airways flights from Heathrow tomorrow have already been cancelled because of the planned strike by air traffic controllers. The disruption at all major airports is expected to be most serious during the morning, and passengers are being advised to check with their airlines before leaving for the airports. Prince Charles has had another fall from horseback, this time during a polo match in Sydney today. He scored two goals but was thrown headlong when his horse was jostled by another.